last century, we've gone from dirt tracks to super highways. From the first internal combustion engines to vehicles that tell us how, where, and when to drive. We have filled our roadways and our airways and sea lanes almost to capacity and nearly doubled our commute time in traffic. Traffic that must be controlled, managed, and regulated. Now, traffic on Modern Marvels. In 1939, this Firebird was a prototype for the car of the future. A sleek, rocket-like automated vehicle that could virtually drive itself. Today, we still can't cross the country in 24 hours, as envisioned by some of the Firebird's designers. But the new millennium does promise to relieve us of much of the tedium and frustration of operating a vehicle in heavy congestion, thanks to the advent of Intelligent Transportation Systems, or ITS. Intelligent Transportation Systems apply the technology of the information age, communication, computers, sensors, to solving transportation problems. We see them on television in the navigation system that the rental cars are offering. We will see them in our highway systems as the equivalent of air traffic control, except it will be ground traffic control that helps us manage uh, the traffic system that we use every day. One element of ITS that we may soon see on our vehicles is adaptive cruise control, which senses cars ahead and alters speeds accordingly, using a variety of different sensors. Cars will communicate with each other, thereby avoiding collisions and eliminating faulty human judgment. Driving with ITS will be faster and safer, allowing us to reduce congestion and better manage our existing roadways. Traffic management is a relatively recent concept, less than 100 years old. But our need to transport ourselves and our goods goes back to prehistoric times, when foot traffic simply followed the narrow tracks made by animals. But these old paths proved inadequate once we domesticated animals and began using them for dragging and hauling. The development of the wheel in 5000 BC meant that stronger manufactured roads were needed, so roads made of stone started appearing in the Middle East as early as 4000 BC. Trade was the major factor in the evolution of roads. The Etruscans began developing the Amber Roads, an extensive network of trade routes in Europe as early as 1900 BC. And trade also prompted the development of the famous Silk Road, a collection of caravan routes that eventually became an active trade route between China and the Mediterranean. War was as much a stimulus for road building and transport as trade. The Persian Royal Road, built by King Darius I in 500 BC, was the first example of a road constructed primarily for military or administrative reasons. In an early attempt at traffic control and efficiency, Darius ordered that his road should bypass many significant towns to reduce travel time and to avoid the main population centers where resistance to his troop movements would be the strongest. Conquest also prompted the remarkable road building achievements of the Romans, who created a road system that served Europe, Asia Minor, and Northern Africa until the coming of the train two millennia later. The Romans created the first traffic information devices with their milestones, which indicated the distance in leagues to Rome from any point in the empire. And they were also the first to introduce one-way streets in an effort to minimize congestion in the city center. In ancient Rome, traffic congestion was so severe that at one point Julius Caesar banned carts from the central city to avoid the problems that they were causing. Traffic congestion was also a problem in 18th century London, so much so that the world's first three traffic cops were assigned to London Bridge. Selected for their unusual height, these three tall men were instructed to enforce new regulations requiring carts, coaches, and other carriages coming into the city to keep along the west side of the bridge, while all traffic leaving the city stayed on the east side of the bridge. In England in the early 1800s, the development of rail lines was prompted by the appearance of steam-powered vehicles on the highways. 
When the gentry started objecting to the noisy coaches, the highly restrictive Locomotives on the Highways Act was passed, which required that each vehicle have a man walking ahead of it, carrying a red flag in the daytime and a red lantern at night as a warning to oncoming traffic. The maximum speed of the steam coaches was limited to four miles an hour, so the vehicles took to the rails instead. One of the things you have to realize is that in a lot of transportation issues, there are not necessarily new ideas. There are reapplication of existing ideas. For instance, signals, modern signals, trace their roots back to railroad lamps and to a large extent. Those signals trace their origins back to fires, lighthouses, things that were used for navigational purposes that may not have been part of a road or a highway, but a lighthouse out on a peak. The railroads became increasingly important in both England and America, and a firm of British railway signal manufacturers made the first lighted device for controlling street traffic. London's Houses of Parliament were the site of the first traffic signal using colored lights. Installed late in 1868, the 22-foot-high signal used manually activated semaphores with red and green gas lights at night to indicate stop or caution to all persons in charge of vehicles or horses. The new device was not entirely successful, but the police commission recommended that the semaphore signal be modified and installed in other parts of the city. Meanwhile, other countries began experimenting with similar traffic control devices and creating some unusual signals of their own. New York City, all the big cities had congestion problems caused by horses, carriages, trolleys, and other uh, common devices of the day. It became very obvious that there needed to be some means of controlling traffic at the intersections, because that's where the problem is. And one of the early pioneers in this area was William Phelps Eno, who put a lot of effort into identifying the needs for traffic control. William Phelps Eno wrote the first printed traffic regulations of the New York police, issued in 1903. New York had actually had an organized force of traffic police since 1860, but Eno recommended that more men be hired. By 1908, the Bureau of Street Traffic had 743 men, 138 of them on horseback and 18 on bicycles. And Eno added whistles to their repertoire of arm and hand signals and shouted instructions. Even the most inspired efforts of the police, however, couldn't control the chaotic traffic of the early 1900s. So in 1908, semaphores, or manually operated traffic control signals, similar to the one which had first appeared in London half a century earlier, started sprouting up all over the country. The semaphore arms, featuring stop and go in white on a green background, stood more than eight feet high and were operated by a traffic officer who blew a police whistle before changing the sign. Another popular variation on the semaphore was a beach umbrella with the word stop and go painted on the canvas. The officer stayed underneath the umbrella and rotated it as needed. There were several problems with the semaphores, one of the most significant of which was visibility. And it can be very difficult for a driver of a vehicle to pick out a semaphore in the midst of a complicated urban scenery. Plus, it can be very difficult for the vehicles behind the first vehicle to see that semaphore. And if they can't see when they're supposed to stop, and there were no brake lights on vehicles in those days, then you start having rear-end collisions. Uh, the, the need for police officers to be in the middle of the roadway presented uh, a safety concern to the police officers themselves. Introduced in Paris in 1912, the traffic tower offered police officers directing traffic both safety and visibility. But the anarchistic French drivers ignored the tower signals, and it was abandoned after only 22 days. But not before it had been observed by American traffic pioneer William Phelps Eno. Eno designed a crow's nest at the top of the tower and proposed this modified version for New York. 
but it was installed instead in Detroit in 1917 at the intersection of Woodward and Michigan Avenues, which was then one of the busiest corners in the world. That marked the beginning of a boom in American traffic towers. Some of them were very ornamental. Some of them were very functional. Uh, again, the traffic signals of the day had no uniformity. Some of them might be underneath the crow's nest that the police officer was positioned in. Some of them might be above the crow's nest. The concept was to put the police officer in the tower so he could see traffic on all four approaches to an intersection. Even before the advent of traffic towers, alternating electromechanical traffic signals, the true precursors to our own signal lights, began appearing, although their exact origin and location remain uncertain. Because a lot of this activity occurred separately, many people had similar ideas at different times around the same period. It's very difficult to pin down who did the first white line, who came up with the yellow line, who did the traffic light, who came up with the stop sign. Uh, it's very, it, although there's many claimants, it's very difficult to say which was truly the first. In the United States, the number of automobiles began increasing dramatically after the turn of the century. From about 8,000 vehicles in 1900 to more than 8 million in 1915. This meant that new roads would have to be designed and built and that traffic would have to be controlled. In the beginning, most signal lights were simply red or green until that proved inadequate. Experience showed that drivers needed some advance notice that a traffic signal was changing from a green or go indication to a stop indication. Before deciding on the amber caution light we have today, traffic engineers experimented with several other ways of alerting drivers to a signal change, including bells and whistles. There are traffic signals that have countdown lights in the face of the signal. They have a big red ball and a big green ball and a series of smaller red balls and green balls in between the two big ones. The number of smaller lights would decrease. At the same time, state and federal officials also had to decide on uniformity in signals and signage, which differed tremendously from city to city. Finally, in 1930, the National Conference on Street and Highway Safety produced the Manual on Street Traffic Signs, Signals, and Markings. Gradually, they settled on a set of signs that had certain characteristics. Shape was very important because in that era, there were many drivers who were not literate and would not be able to read the message on the sign. Therefore, a distinctive shape was chosen for each type of sign. And they decided that round would be the greatest danger, round having an infinite number of sides. And they decided that that would apply to railroad crossings. The next shape they decided would be an eight-sided shape. And that would be used at intersections to indicate the need for a stop. And then they used a four-sided sign to provide a warning. In 1932, the year that the first formal traffic engineering codes were established in the U.S., Germany built the world's first freeway, the Autobahn, a 20-kilometer stretch running from Bonn to Cologne. Hitler saw the military advantage of having a four-lane nationwide system of roads with controlled access, roads where vehicles could enter and leave without interrupting traffic. In 1937, President Franklin D. Roosevelt proposed a national highway system for the United States, similar to the Autobahns. Although the hugely ambitious project wouldn't begin for nearly two decades, it was designed to solve congestion and other problems of the 30s and 40s. The cities were facing problems as a result of suburbanization, tax base moving to the suburbs, leaving behind blighted areas of low-income residents creating drains on city services at the same time that the tax base is moving elsewhere. With these problems in mind, the people behind the interstate system pictured it as a way of 
saving the city. In the 1990s, we blamed the interstate system for causing problems that we were intending to solve in the first place, namely congestion, suburbanization, and sprawl. For a nation caught between the dual crises of the Great Depression and World War II, the 1939 World's Fair in New York offered hope and a promise of better times. Featuring the work of the world's foremost designers, the fair, called Building the World of Tomorrow, was the last grand showcase of the industrial age. And its most popular exhibit was Futurama at the General Motors Pavilion, designed by Norman Bel Geddes. Futurama gave visitors a tour of the of a magic motorways that were expected to be in existence by 1960. Visitors were shown the super highways, multi-lane, varying speeds depending on the lane, and traffic was controlled by monitors in towers who sent signals to the vehicles so that they would speed or slow depending on circumstances. Firebird 2 to control tower. We're about to take off on the highway of tomorrow. Stand by. Despite the optimism of Futurama, the highway of tomorrow had to wait for World War II. But when World War II finally ended, there was a building boom in roads and highways, thanks largely to President Dwight Eisenhower. When he was in Germany after World War II, he observed the highway network they had, the, the system of autobahns that allowed the German military to move quickly from one part of the country to another. And when he became president, he recognized the need to establish funding for a program of interstate and defense highways. What we now call interstate highways was technically and, and correctly known as the National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. Eisenhower authorized construction of the U.S. interstate system in 1956, little realizing it would become the greatest public works project ever attempted. At the time, the expectation was that the 41,000-mile network could be completed within 13 years. As a result, Congress authorized funding to cover that period. The need to modify the highways to address environmental and other concerns increased the cost. The cost of right-of-way in, in cities particularly was higher than expected. To complete the system, which ended up 42,800 miles, took a little bit over 40 years. The standards for the four-lane interstates were highly regulated, with 12-foot-wide lanes, 10-foot-wide shoulders, 14 feet of clearance under each bridge, and access controlled by on- and off-ramps. You can think about freeways as an advancement on the street system. Uh, bigger, better street, no traffic signals should allow you to go faster. Uh, the way you achieve that is to put ramps in that connect the different levels. You can have a so-called cloverleaf ramp, a, a circular ramp that joins, goes from one level to another level. The grade separated multi-level cloverleaf that is such a distinct feature of America's interstates was invented in 1906 by a Frenchman, Eugène Elnard, and first introduced into American roads in the 1920s. Theoretically, the cloverleaf design is the simplest way to connect two freeways because it allows non-stop full access between the two roads. The more complex exchanges used on freeways can combine several variations of cloverleafs and are often called spaghetti junctions or spaghetti bowls. Road design and traffic signs are only a part of the traffic engineer's job. Coming up, the human factor safety features, and computerized traffic management were designed for travel at 70 miles per hour. Higher speeds meant better traffic flow and greater hazards. So traffic engineers, many of them based at the Texas Traffic Institute, worked to design a more forgiving environment for freeway drivers. Safety is a big part of what's been going on in the roadway environment for the last three or four decades uh, at least. The more forgiving environment that we've tried to create is a function of a lot of different treatments. There's a lot of different ways to stop a vehicle from hitting a concrete pillar. 
you put up guardrails that redirect vehicles away from hazards or uh, back into uh, safer areas as opposed to letting them hit a ditch or uh, some sort of fixed object. The design also uh, improved dramatically with wider clear zones. You can run off a road and not hit something solid now uh, in most cases uh, where in a, in a street or a higher level street, early freeway design, there are a lot of fixed objects next to the road. Breakaway signs and lights, softer concrete, and crash cushions have all contributed to a safer driving environment. But traffic engineers don't just consider the environment in which we drive. They also take into account the human factor, which is the field of science that attempts to optimize the interaction between people and their environment. In the transportation environment, what we're trying to do is find ways that we can help drivers uh, drive more smoothly, more steadily. We're also trying to find ways to help drivers to be safer in environment. A human factors person might look at uh, the types of colors and the size of the text and the type of text that's presented on signs on the side of the road. Uh, if you're a driver, you can't afford to be looking at a sign for very long. Uh, before you're, you're in a ditch somewhere because you're not paying attention to the, to the driving task. Much of the human factors research is conducted in TTI's state-of-the-art driving simulator, which allows scientists to learn how people's perceptions can influence their driving. I've put a series of cars on the side of the road. Uh, as I'm driving down the road, I become accustomed to the rate that those cars are going past my vision. Uh, we'll see shortly here, it'll be like blink, 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 blink. As I continue at the same speed, the car, the distance between the cars will decrease. And that gives me a sense that I am starting to travel a little bit faster. As we see here, it's blink, another car blink, another car blink, and the distance starts to decrease between the cars. And in turn, I feel like I'm starting to go a little bit faster. In turn, if I'm expected to maintain a particular speed limit and I think I'm going faster, my response is to begin to slow down. Now, we're not going to park cars on the edge of the road to, to alter drivers' perception and to make them drive slower or faster. But instead of using cars or uh, previous experiments have used stripes on tunnel walls, big obnoxious stripes, uh, if we were to use uh, small shrubs parked on a uh, planet at the side of the road or fence posts at particular intervals, we can give drivers a perception of how fast they're going and then we can change that perception in order to alter their behavior. The Texas Traffic Institute simulator can be used for driver training and to demonstrate potential road and sign designs before they're applied to the real world. This is particularly useful when it comes to geometric standards or the curves and grades that are used in a road. One of the things the engineers did in the early days of the interstate is they needed to put in a road from point A to point B and engineers being engineers, they drew a straight line and that's where the road was, where the, the natural topography would allow them to put a road straight and true. They found out that the accident rates on those absolutely straight roadways were higher than they should have been. And part of the reason is drivers were bored to the point of falling asleep or being hypnotized, road hypnosis. The driver has to be challenged a little bit, and so a few curves here and there are, are good because they keep the driver paying attention to the driving task. The Texas Traffic Institute also has a fully functional traffic management center similar to those in Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, and Washington, D.C. Los Angeles first opened its traffic operations center in 1971 with the Alaska Project, a study that monitored a 42-mile loop of the busy L.A. freeway system. The purpose of the study was to test state-of-the-art techniques for improving freeway operations. The basis for the Alaska Project was loops in the pavement roughly every one half mile that was a non-technical, a relay closed in the field when vehicles passed over the loops. That information was sent back to a central computer 
every 20 or 30 seconds to do the data analysis for any of the traffic management techniques that we employed during that project. In 1998, Caltrans, which is the California Department of Transportation, replaced the operations center with a sleek new traffic management center. Operated in collaboration with the California Highway Patrol, the TMC manages and regulates traffic flow on some 1,100 miles of freeway and highway in Los Angeles and Ventura counties. How we receive our information from the embedded loops and from the ramp meter system is that we have a network of fiber optic uh, uh, lines which brings in the information into our center. We have approximately 250 miles of fiber optic communication system that is already embedded out there under pavement which allows us to communicate with all our infrastructure out there. Uh, the infrastructure that we have, the loops and the ramp meters, are sending in back in data every 30 seconds to the center. So over the course of time, we start to see a pattern, whether congestion is building, what is the cause of the congestion, where all of a sudden there is a lot of uh, vehicles that are not moving. The function of the traffic management center is to give as well as to receive information. So in addition to the almost 200 closed-circuit television cameras positioned on the area's freeways and an AM low-band frequency highway advisory radio, Caltrans has more than 120 message signs to inform drivers of accidents or poor road conditions. When we see something that's occurring on the system, maybe there's an accident or some detour that we need to establish, we give that information out to the motor so that they can make some real-time decisions to take alternate routes, maybe to use another freeway or to use a city street alternative route. The Traffic Management Center is also the headquarters of the Freeway Service Patrol, which has 150 vehicles available to provide free assistance to motorists in need who can contact the California Highway Patrol through a network of more than 4,900 solar-powered freeway call boxes located throughout the two counties. The Traffic Management Center operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Traffic in Southern California, which is now so congested that peak traffic periods, what's known as the rush hour, last nearly eight hours a day. Since there is no room in which to build new roads or expand the interstate system, experts agree that the only way to cope with the increasing traffic is to aggressively manage the existing system. Traffic management centers owe a great deal to other forms of transportation, most notably aviation. Next, just as road vehicles require management and control, so does air and sea traffic. there were no navigational aids, no traffic control, and no means of communicating between air and ground. Pilots flew only in daylight, in fairly clear weather, operating on a C and B scene basis. The aircraft of the 1930s were reasonably slow, so pilots could readily see and avoid other aircraft. An organized system of air traffic control wasn't necessary because the only real congestion occurred in the vicinity of local airports. These airports bore little resemblance to the airports of today. The pilots themselves decided when, how, and where they wanted to land. But it soon became apparent that some form of traffic control would have to be introduced around airports, or the results would be catastrophic. The first means of air traffic control occurred in 1931 at, in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. And uh, there was a, a controller, the very first controller, his name was Archie League, and he actually cleared aircraft to take off and land using semi-force legs. And, and that's the uh, very first genesis of air traffic control. There was no way to give separate instructions to two planes landing simultaneously. So the semaphores were soon replaced by light guns, which allowed the controller to direct a narrow beam of high-intensity colored light to a specific aircraft. The light guns also meant that controllers could come in from the weather and operate instead from a glassed-in room on top of a hangar, the predecessor to today's sophisticated control towers. 
As we've progressed, uh, certainly the first uh, high-tech piece of equipment that was developed was the communication capability between the aircraft and the air traffic controller or the radio operator in the, the early stages. By 1935, many pilots were flying under instrument flight rules instead of visual flight rules. So there was a critical need to establish separation of aircraft flying between airports. At the government's request, four of the major airlines established a number of en route air traffic control units, the first of which was located in Newark, New Jersey. A year later, management of these stations was taken over by the Department of Commerce. The tracking operations were definitely low tech. In fact, I have a couple pieces of plastic that we call shrimp boats. Uh, we actually used to have a flat display uh, that was used by the air traffic controller and in that flat display you could see targets and they wrote on these pieces of plastic the call sign of the aircraft along with the altitude of the aircraft placed the shrimp boat on top of the target and used that to track the aircraft. They also had the benefit of primitive radar during the 1950s and 1960s, in the air traffic control environment, we used military-type radars that came out of the 40 eras. Congress created the Federal Aviation Agency late in 1958. This meant that a single central agency would finally be responsible for developing and maintaining a common civil and military system of air navigation and air traffic control. In today's environment, we have a multitude of navigational aids, communication aids, and radar systems throughout the United States. There are over 40,000 pieces of equipment deployed in the United States to assist the pilot in moving from one location to another. At the Air Traffic Control System Command Center in Virginia, the director and controller of traffic management for the entire country can monitor both the weather and the position of every aircraft in the air over the United States. This is a representation of the all the aircraft that are airborne in the system currently. There are over 5,700 aircraft that are airborne being worked by the 20 domestic air route traffic control centers within the United States. The, uh, the aircraft or the dots on the screen represent individual aircraft. For traffic management purposes, which is what we use this particular presentation for, uh, it, it certainly is more than adequate in being able to adjust traffic flows and understand where there are congestion areas within the system from our east coast all the way to our west coast. We're looking at the screen two-dimensionally. We're looking at a, a, a flat screen presentation, and certainly there is a vertical component to that in altitude also. And I've seen as many as 6,400 aircraft airborne at a particular time on the screen. Uh, however, from a capacity standpoint, certainly the airspace would handle many, many more aircraft than that. The sophisticated technology used in tracking aircraft has also influenced one of the oldest forms of transportation, marine traffic. In the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, one of the largest ports in the world and the busiest complex in the nation, technology is given a helping hand by the port pilots. Piloting and pilotage has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, probably originated uh, the first time a vessel ventured out of its own home waters and, and went into a harbor they were not familiar with, and they engaged the services of, uh, of a seaman uh, that knows the harbor. Ancient times, uh, probably 1500s or even before, pilots charted or drew their own charts of local waters, and that's how pilots gain their value. Uh, countries would fight over those charts even to get trade routes and entries into different ports in the world. The pilots know the local weather, the shoals, currents, and tides. They know the port well enough to be able to navigate through fog. And they also know where the smaller private boats are, where the fishing boats congregate, and how the port is constantly changing. The port has changed dramatically uh, in the past few years. It's getting deeper. It's getting narrower, the ship channels are getting narrower, narrower, and the ships are getting longer and wider. The huge ships and the changes brought on by construction are only some of the dangers facing the ports, the pilots, and the people who sail into Los Angeles Long Beach Harbor. 
Working with uh, the various sectors of the industry presents a wide range of challenges. Uh, for example, the deep draft and commercial industry here presents one set of risks. That set of risks is a grounding and an oil spill, a collision, an explosion or loss of life, or damage to a marine terminal or a facility. The pilot boards a ship outside the breakwater. Hello, Captain. Hello, welcome. Hello. How was your trip? Excellent. And then guides the vessel both in and out of the port. After, good morning to you, Captain. Could you come outside just a little bit, meet me between the sea buoy and the gate, put up one line, center lead transom, please? I'll do it, do that. NYK Altair, this is traffic. Good evening, sir. The port also has the Marine Exchange, a unique vessel tracking service similar to an airport control tower that works in conjunction with the U.S. Coast Guard to monitor all ship movements within the harbor and within a 25-mile area of responsibility outside the breakwater. These are uh, the traffic separation schemes. These are found all over the world in and out of uh, your larger ports. They are sort of like the interstate highway system. Here you have your outbound traffic lane, and here you have your inbound traffic lane. And this uh, pink zone is a separation zone that ships are supposed to keep out of that area. The shipping lanes, or traffic separation schemes, are important near ports, where traffic congestion is the greatest. With regard to sea lanes on the open high seas, the, it's wide open. The, there are no designations other than weather. Normally when you go on Trans-Pacific, you don't have all that much traffic. When you start getting closer to the ports, that's when you start getting that traffic, much like on a highway system. Los Angeles Long Beach is the world's third largest container port in terms of volume. KB260, APL Korea. Korea, All the containers that have come into Los Angeles also have to go out. So the harbor complex is a hive of traffic activity. Rail and surface traffic as well as maritime. When the ship does come into port, it is a constant cycle of discharging and loading at the same time. Depending upon the commodity and depending upon the mode of transportation, um, some of it can be moved as quickly as three hours after it is discharged. Our on-dock rail environment, our goal is that once it is discharged from the vessel, within eight hours it will be reloaded and departing from this terminal for cities across North America. The goods that have arrived in the port on container ships are moved out on trucks and trains thereby becoming a large part of our surface transportation and traffic systems. Next, the future of surface traffic. Although engineers try to estimate future capacity when they build roads, there was no way of knowing what sort of traffic volume the interstate highway system would have to handle. And any of the roads that are out there were originally designed for traffic volumes that were projected to be 20 or 25 years in the future, they reach those traffic volumes in 10 years, and that was 30 years ago. So we need to be inventive in how we move more vehicles and move more people and more goods through our surface transportation system. One method of increasing volume on that system has been the high occupancy vehicle lanes, or HOVs. Although they have proven remarkably effective, they were met with a certain amount of resistance in many parts of the country. There's a perception that the HOV lanes aren't being used. Sometimes that's, they're operating right where the HOV lanes are the most effective, which means they're still in free flow and you're getting that tremendous time savings, but you're getting enough use that you're carrying double what the lane next to it is carrying. HOV lanes are only part of the solution. Today, the greatest hope for traffic management lies in intelligent transportation systems technology. One of the most comprehensive tests of ITS was conducted in 1997 on Interstate 15 near San Diego, California where the carpool lane was used to test smart cars.
fully automated vehicles controlled by computers sense vehicles or obstacles ahead and alter speed accordingly. Vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication is also an important element of ITS. Essentially, one vehicle communicates to another that I am going to leave the automated lane and go into the manual lane. Well, the platoon of cars has to open up from its very tight configuration to allow that car to get out and then close up. Or the car will communicate, I want to come in from the manual lane to the automated lane. You are putting sensors on the front of the car to see what is ahead of it and to warn the driver that something is in front. Um, the next stage of that is to actually have the automobile react because the machine reaction, this is hard for people to believe, but the machine reaction is much, much faster than a human reaction. And so we're looking at then being able to take better advantage of those few seconds of time to prevent the accident. Intelligent transportation systems present yet another challenge for scientists studying human factors. Before more advanced technologies are put into cars, we need to ask some serious questions about how are people going to react and how are people going to perceive uh, the advent of technology in vehicles and on roadways. People are going to be scared. They're going to, you know, what, what happens when this car takes control away from me and it's controlling where I'm driving. You know, is it going to be e as easy as my just picking up the newspaper and I punch a button and it starts to drive around the world and drives me off to work and to the grocery store? Japan and Europe have already introduced many ITS elements into their cars, including in-vehicle navigation systems combined with personalized traffic information. It is no longer telling you the most direct route simply based on a flat map. It is intelligent. Today, the best route may be around the beltway. Tomorrow, it may be taking the other side of the beltway or an arterial. Depending on the incidents, what's happening with construction, uh, how the, the signals are being timed for events during the day, all of that can come in from the, the traffic management center to the vehicle overlaid on the map and you have just told your navigation unit I want to go from here to there. Onboard navigation systems and other elements of ITS are concepts that date back to the Futurama exhibit of 1939. Long before the United States experienced the great construction boom that produced the interstate highway system. Although we may never again embark on that grand public works project, we must continue to maintain our roads and retrofit them for ITS, a substantial challenge for the traffic engineers of tomorrow. But experts believe that we will be able to meet that challenge, particularly if we look to the aviation industry for inspiration. It's getting the same capability that we have with a radar system, that we have with the air traffic controller being able to communicate with the pilot, providing the driver with the same amount of information that the manager of the highway system has so that that person can make the most intelligent decision on which route I ought to take, what time I ought to travel, and what my expected travel time would be. A transcontinental surface trip in 24 hours? Not yet. Maybe never. But the traffic of the 21st century does promise to be safer and more efficient than the futurists of the 20th century could ever have imagined. Tonight on Modern Marvel's Wednesday, this ultimate war machine was based on innovative American engineering. But this hell on wheels led the Russian army to victory. The T-34 on Modern Marvel's Tonight at 10 on the History Channel.
Etruscans began developing the Amber Roads, an extensive network of trade routes in Europe as early as 1900 BC. And trade also prompted the development of the famous Silk Road, a collection of caravan routes that eventually became an active trade route between China and the Mediterranean. War was as much a stimulus for road building and transport as trade. The Persian Royal Road, built by King Darius I in 500 BC, was the first example of a road constructed primarily for military or administrative reasons. In an early attempt at traffic control and efficiency, Darius ordered that his road should bypass many significant towns to reduce travel time and to avoid the main population centers where resistance to his troop movements would be the strongest. Conquest also prompted the remarkable road building achievements of the Romans, who created a road system that served Europe, Asia Minor, and Northern Africa until the coming of the train two millennia later. The Romans created the first traffic information devices with their milestones, which indicated the distance in leagues to Rome from any point in the empire. And they were also the first to introduce one-way streets in an effort to minimize congestion in the city center. In ancient Rome, traffic congestion was so suffering. We will see them in our highway systems as the equivalent of air traffic control, except it will be ground traffic control that helps us manage uh, the traffic system that we use every day. One element of ITS that we may soon see on our vehicles is adaptive cruise control, which senses cars ahead and alters speeds accordingly using a variety of different sensors. Cars will communicate with each other, thereby avoiding collisions and eliminating faulty human judgment. Driving with ITS will be faster and safer, allowing us to reduce congestion and better manage our existing roadways. Traffic management is a relatively recent concept, less than 100 years old. But our need to transport ourselves and our goods goes back to prehistoric times, when foot traffic simply followed the narrow tracks made by animals. But these old paths proved inadequate once we domesticated animals and began using them for dragging and hauling. The development of the wheel in 5000 BC meant that stronger manufactured roads were needed, so roads made of stone started appearing in the Middle East as early as 4000 BC. Trade was the major factor in the evolution of roads. Modern signals trace their roots back to railroad lamps and to a large extent. Those signals trace their origins back to fires, lighthouses, things that were used for navigational purposes that may not have been part of a road or a highway, but a lighthouse out on a peak. The railroads became increasingly important in both England and America, and a firm of British railway signal manufacturers made the first lighted device for controlling street traffic. London's Houses of Parliament were the site of the first traffic signal using colored lights. Installed late in 1868, the 22-foot high signal used manually activated semaphores with red and green gas lights at night to indicate stop or caution to all persons in charge of vehicles or horses. The new device was not entirely successful, but the police commission recommended that the semaphore signal be modified and installed in other parts of the city. Meanwhile, other countries began experimenting with similar traffic control devices and creating some unusual signals of their own. New York City, all the big cities had congestion problems caused by horses, carriages, trolleys, and other uh, common devices of the day. It was severe that at one point Julius Caesar banned carts from the central city to avoid the problems that they were causing. Traffic congestion was also a problem in 18th century London, so much so that the world's first three traffic cops were assigned to London Bridge. Selected for their unusual height, these three tall men were instructed to enforce new regulations requiring carts, coaches, and other carriages coming into the city to keep along the west side of the bridge, while all traffic leaving the city stayed on the east side of the bridge. In England in the early 1800s, 
the development of rail lines was prompted by the appearance of steam-powered vehicles on the highways. When the gentry started objecting to the noisy coaches, the highly restrictive Locomotives on the Highways Act was passed, which required that each vehicle have a man walking ahead of it, carrying a red flag in the daytime and a red lantern at night as a warning to oncoming traffic. The maximum speed of the steam coaches was limited to four miles an hour, so the vehicles took to the rails instead. One of the things you have to realize that in a lot of transportation issues, there are not necessarily new ideas. There are reapplication of existing ideas. For instance, signals. In little more than a century, we've gone from dirt tracks to super highways. From the first internal combustion engines to vehicles that tell us how, where, and when to drive. We have filled our roadways and our airways and sea lanes almost to capacity and nearly doubled our commute time in traffic. Traffic that must be controlled, managed, and regulated. Now, traffic on Modern Marvels. In 1939, this Firebird was a prototype for the car of the future. A sleek, rocket-like automated vehicle that could virtually drive itself. Today, we still can't cross the country in 24 hours, as envisioned by some of the Firebird's designers. But the new millennium does promise to relieve us of much of the tedium and frustration of operating a vehicle in heavy congestion, thanks to the advent of Intelligent Transportation Systems, or ITS. Intelligent Transportation Systems apply the technology of the information age, communication, computers, sensors, to solving transportation problems. We see them on television in the navigation system. The rental cars are 